Good afternoon everyone. Thanks for joining us again. We are, excuse me, we are continuing in <clears throat> answering uh, the good question we got um, the other day on our YouTube channel. What the primary differences are between justification by new birth and justification by faith, the well-traveled Protestant justification by faith doctrine of salvation. Okay, and <clears throat> we went over 12 here, and um, <clears throat> we're just going to jump in, and um, I'm really hoping, hoping to use this uh, to kind of iron all of this out, and um, create a booklet that will be helpful for people. So, <clears throat> we've got 12 there, and um, I'm going to look at my notes here, and we're just going to jump in and continue right on. If you want to add to our conversation, you can email us at mail at um, mail at tank.online, that's T-A-N-C, or go to our Facebook page. And if you go to paulspassingthoughts.com, paulspassingthoughts.com, <clears throat> right there on the home page is today's uh, links, and uh, you can chime right on in. And we'll just continue on, and if we need tomorrow to finish up all of these, that's, that's what we'll do. Okay, um, Okay. so 11, we, um, uh, we got 10 definition of faith there. We covered that in the last part. Um, 11, uh, authority, uh, we covered that. Um, our only authority in the home fellowship movement being guided by uh, the true gospel of justification by new birth, um, our only authority is the one head, which is Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, okay? Therefore, go out and preach the gospel. There's um, all... Um, <clears throat> all ideologies or theologies that suggests a uh, co-shepherd shepherding or co-authority or you know uh, regency appointed by heaven um, all of the scriptures used to make a case for that is a jump of logic okay uh, just because Christ called himself a shepherd or he's referred to as a shepherd and so as pastors, oh heart, that must mean we're the under shepherds and are Christ's authority over salvation on earth. And it's just again, uh, back on this authority thing, number 11, it's just not, you know, authority. When we talk about authority, what authority? Uh, define that authority. Well, let me define you find it for you. It's, author it's an authority over salvation. Okay? Supposedly, according to church, church, the church institution, alright, and you can't separate, I have totally gotten away from using the term institutional church, because it, again, uh, like, um, you know, using the term reformed, gives people wiggle room and a back door out of owning what Protestantism is. Okay? Um, using the term institutional church gives people an out for owning what church is lock, stock, and barrel. You can't separate institution from church. Church is an institution. And you can't separate uh, reformed theology from Protestantism. The Protestant, you know, reformation, all Protestantism is reformed soteriology, okay? Um, it's all reformed. 
All right, so uh, let's do a quick check on our Facebook pages here. Um, and I'm going to go actually to the page, all right, uh, where we can, um, you can post comments there right under the live video that, um, that uh, Andy has been so gracious to uh, share over there. And I've got to start remembering to do that as well, to share it from my Facebook page over to the um, uh, Church Live. Uh, page link posted there on paulspassingthoughts.com. Now that's going to sag us right in to number twelve uh, fellowship. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the Bible does say that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. All right. Oh, where is that Hebrews? 10, I think, someplace like that. I don't know. It's the biggie verse, Hebrews 10, 25, or whatever it is. It's the one that is always going to get crammed down your throat. Forsake the assembling of each other, not together, or whatever. And it just cracks me up a big one to where that means church. Somehow, do not, you know, stop assembling together. Um, you know, forsake not the assembling of each other together. Hark! Even though church is nowhere in that passage, okay, or elder authority or anything else, uh, by golly, that's what it means. Well, where? We get the same assumption from Matthew 18, the so-called church discipline, um, uh, chapter, which is a good example of the kind of leaps of logic we get uh, from church soteriology. In Matthew 18, where is church? It's not in there. Okay? For that matter, where are the elders? They're not in there. Okay? Um, you know, Matthew 18 supposedly teaches that church discipline is this um, tool unique to elder authority to keep everybody in line. Elders aren't in there and church isn't in there. Okay? Church discipline, let's talk about that. Church discipline isn't in there, but yet we get church discipline out of there. Uh, furthermore, where is church discipline anywhere in the Bible? Okay? It's not. Okay? There's the Lord's discipline. There's self-discipline. I ask, where is church discipline? It's nowhere in the Bible. Okay? So, fellowship, fellowship. Let's address fellowship. What is the difference then between fellowship in regard to um, justification by new birth gospel versus justification by faith? Okay, well, fellowship, okay, um, fellowship according to um, justification by faith, uh, fellowship happens at a place, church, okay? Yeah, and I mean, people go out to uh, lunch after church and this, that, and the other. But um, fellowship happens at church. It involves uh, authority. And um, if in church is this institution that you must submit to and be a member of in order to have fellowship with God. All right? So this is key. We believe that when you're born again by the Spirit of God, all right, as a result of your faith, which is a result of hearing the Word, okay, um, you have immediate fellowship with God, and it's a literal family fellowship. All right, it's a literal 
family fellowship. Um, God is your literal father. Jesus is your literal brother. Church fellowship is a family fellowship, okay, pretty much like the Olive Garden. When you're here, you're family, all right? Now, I understand when you're a faithful member of, an, of a church, okay, um, you know, they love you, your family, you just leave a church, okay, and uh, be no longer committed to that to that fellowship of believers and uh, see how often people call you and follow up with you, okay? So church, when you're there, you're family. When you're a member in good standing, you're family, okay? Um, the whole subject of fellowship is crucial uh, with the home fellowship movement and the gospel of the home fellowship movement is, um, and we're off to a run and start here because there's a lot I want to cover, so that's good. Only 12 after. So, so this fellowship, okay, in the home fellowship movement, which is predicated on justification by new birth, all right, there is no membership, all right? Now, here's another thing that you can't find in the Bible. Church membership. Alright? Well, I mean, when all of those people uh, got saved on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit knew how many there were, so he must have been taking a role. There must have been blah, 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 you know, whatever. Hmm, okay. So, tell me this. We, you know... Church folk focus on the 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 making a a big deal, okay? Um, uh, making a big deal of um, the Holy Spirit knowing how much uh, how many people were saved on Pentecost that day. They make a big deal out of that, but what's not discussed is where did all these people meet the next day? Okay? Uh, where did all these people meet the, the next day? Okay? Um, I mean, a day later, they were, yeah, I mean, a day later, they're meeting together and sharing meals together and sharing the Apostles' Doctrine and so on and so forth the next day. That must have been one heck of a committee meeting. So, what happened? Well, what happened was, is before Pentecost, Jewish believers um, and followers of Jesus and whatever that looked like at the time, they were already meeting in homes. Yes, yeah, some of the synagogues were institutionalized and, and were, you know, approved and overseen by the Roman government. You got to understand, uh, unless you were a pagan, unless you were a pagan religion at the time, um, or, uh, you know, a Jewish synagogue that was approved by either the Pharisees or the Sadducees, okay, it wasn't legal. I mean, uh, an, an institutional purpose build, uh, building or meeting place for any and every sect was not legal, all right? So, basically, what you've got is all of these people were meeting in homes, okay? All of these people were meeting in homes, and after they got saved at, at Pentecost, it was, it was, I mean, what was it, 3,000 of them or something? It was pretty much business as usual. They just went back and met, um, and there were like, right at 400 synagogues, 
uh, in and around Jerusalem at the time. And those synagogues were, were actually very much like today in homes. Okay? Um, and I forget everything that I've learned about the study that I did in that, but um, synagogue, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, actually means small sanctuary. Okay? Um, I've done a lot of study on this. But even in, in our day, so, uh, a synagogue doesn't necessarily have to be um, uh, some purpose build someplace. Many, many synagogues th via Jew Jewish tradition are in private homes. Okay? Um, so, uh, I just wanted to... to uh, clear that up, okay? So, look, the home fellowship doesn't have membership. Official membership never was part of the ecclesia. If you're, if you're a confessed born-again believer that has fellowship with the Son and the Father, what makes you a member of a home fellowship is the fact that you come in fellowship with that group of believers. At any given point, if you stop fellowshipping um, with uh, that group, you're no longer part of that fellowship. Okay? So, fellowship successful fellowship and agreement on fellowship is what determines the fellowship. Not some official legal covenant or church membership. Okay, that's the first thing. Church membership in an institution, it, it, folks, it's just not in the Bible anywhere. Okay? And if you got to put your whole argument on the fact that the Holy Spirit knew how many people got saved on Pentecost, that's pretty bad. If that's the only argument you have, that's a pretty weak argument. All right? So, uh, th that's, that's a big deal there. Okay? And again, that's 1 John 1, the first chapter, the initial verses there. Okay, um, so um, at any rate, let's see what we can move on to here. I'll check for um, uh, for any additional comments. We'll check email first. Okay, and, da -da -da -da. and I think Andy chimed in. Let's get over there to our Facebook page. And, uh, um, we dumped church that we have forsaken the need for fellow. Yeah, yeah, there's that. Okay. Let's go over here and see if there's any comments on the actual live vid. Not yet. Okay, so, um, hold on here. Uh, Okay, so, yeah, I was going to get to that, totally forgot. Um, there's, as Andy indicates here, there's also this issue of the purpose of fellowship, okay, um, is uh, mutual edification, all right, is mutual edification, and I'm going to have to speak to body life, and we get into this big time in the book, and I'm really glad that we do. We, we got to, before we move on from 12, we also got to speak to um, body, you know, fellowship, you know, in the body of Christ as a true family. That's a good way to write that down. Uh, fellowship together as a body, functioning like a body, in God's literal family. Okay? 
So it's for mutual edification. And it's, we function as a body, not a top-down authority structure. Okay? Um, yeah, a caste system. And I use this illustration in the book, and I'm very glad we do. Church functions, like all institutions, church functions as a top-down hierarchy, okay, a spiritual caste system with all of the in infrastructure uh, uh, things and demands that you would imagine, okay, because it's an institution, its success is judged on its building pro projects and numbers, for years, it always drove me nuts, okay, um, that churches, the success of a church was, um, was based on uh, building projects and numbers of people. It drove me nuts and I could never understand it. But I understand it now. It's an institution. And that's how you judge an institution, by numbers of members and its infrastructure, and money in the bank. That's how the success of an institution is, is judged. And church is an institution that's unavoidable. But in the book, okay, the big difference here in our fellowship is the fact that our fellowship uh, yeah, the specific purpose is that ed edification, but it is a body function, not an authority function. And the illustration I make in the book is this. We are a body, and man, what a fabulous illustration. What a fabulous illustration, because let's talk about our bodies, all right? I'm the head of my body the way Christ is the head of his church. Okay, but guess what? I can't tell my body to do squat. Okay? So, th this gets me, like Ephesians. Alright? Well, it says right there, you know, Christ is the head of every man, and man is head of the woman. Okay, there it is right there, the authority structure. Full stop. Who again is missing in that chapter? What is it? Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, again, once again, who's missing in that chapter? The elders are again conspicuously missing. All right. If you're out there and you're listening and you're a pastor and elder, sorry, you have no goose egg, no authority. So I'm the head of my body. And oh, in Ephesians 5, okay, Ephesians 5, it's the head, okay, not like boss of a corporation, you know, boss, chief of an Indian tribe. It's not that kind of head. It's the head of a body, okay? So I'm the head of my body, all right? Guess what? I have no authority over my body, okay? I have no, I mean, yeah. So the body has voluntary muscles and involuntary muscles. And muscles are the things that keep our body going. Okay, we got the smooth muscles, there are the organ mu uh, muscles, and the rough muscles that are attached to the bones that are the uh, um, voluntary muscles, which means, okay, I can tell my muscles to do something, uh, all right? But guess what? If something's wrong, with my body or my central nervous system, if something's not functioning well, I can sit there and I can want my arm and my hand to pick this up and write something, 
all day long and guess what I can command my arm and hand to do that all day long okay and it ain't gonna happen all right um, and then I've got all of this involuntary muscles going um, uh, going on that are controlled by cells that literally have a mind of their own okay uh, and, and and are human bodies in and of themselves with their own minds that are programmed to do all of these involuntary uh, body bodily functions that I have no control over whatsoever like my heart okay so when the when the Bible uses the the body or or bows okay when when the Bible uses uh, a human body as an illustration this is what it's speaking to it's not about authority okay it's about the assembly or the ecclesia of Christ functioning like a body. Now, with all that said, and this is exactly 1 Corinthians chapter 13, um, every function of the body is just as important as the others, and in a matter of fact, the body parts that are the smallest and unseen, like your heart, okay, are the most important and visibility, do, you know, doesn't matter that much. It's all of the body parts working together, cooperating together, and being healthy. With that said, I can't control my heart. I can't command my heart. I can't control my stomach. I can't control my bowels. Okay. Um, yeah, I can. I can desire and make a decision uh, I mean it's not even really a command I just make a decision to pick this up because I want to do some writing and um, my arm and my hand and my central nervous system and the muscles attached to those bones are just very loving and decide to cooperate and it's a cooperative effort based on what I desire to do and um, since those parts are all moving well yeah, you know I'm able to do what I want to do okay but if there's something wrong with my central nervous system um, or you know I've got gangrene or something in this arm or the arms injured guess what I could command this arm you know, or if I've got a muscle disease or something, okay, and that part of the body is sick, I could command that arm to to do what I want it to do all day long. And guess what? All right. Now let's talk about this. Authority. When it gets right down to authority, let's remember that Jesus Christ and his apostles okay um, um, they didn't even utilize authority when they had their ministry on earth okay they utilized persuasion oh, Jesus Christ could have come down and and brought a you know a couple of angels with them and taken over the whole world okay um, the same way with the Apostles yeah, in some instances they demonstrated authority, okay, but for the most part they didn't function by authority. When um, when Paul and what's his name, I forget, had a disagreement and went their separate ways, Paul didn't pull rank on the guy, okay. When the, when the Bereans were listening to Paul preach and said, Hey, you know, I don't know, Paul. I think we'll, we'll go home and search the scriptures on our own. Paul didn't pull rank on them. Okay? Um, in fact, in Galatians 1.8, Paul says, If me or an angel or anyone else 
comes preaching a, a gospel uh, other than what's been preached to you, uh, let them be accursed. Okay? So, the Christ and the apostles never implemented authority to begin with. Now, when it gets right down to the nitty gritty, there's authority in the world, but you know what? Authority can't make anybody do anything. Authority may coerce you, um, authority may coerce you and play on your fears and persuade you to do something that you don't want to do because you weigh the consequences so you make a choice to obey. But when it gets right down to it, if I've taken hostage and they say denounce Christ right now, or we'll cut your head off. Uh, I could sit there and say, cut my head off, but you can't make me do what you want me to do. When it gets right down to it, nobody can make anybody do anything. I guess you could sneak up behind them and st stick them with a syringe with some kind of drug on it, drug in it, and uh, when they pass out and they're laying on the ground, you can make them lift their arm because you're the, you're the one that grabs it and lifts it up and down. But my point is, is when it gets right down to the nitty gritty, authority can't make anybody do anything. Authority is a misnomer of sorts to begin with. Now love, is something entirely different. Okay? Love is something entirely different. Okay? Love is the only real reality. Okay? Um, so, um, that's how our fellowship works. Now, Andy says also, and let us consider one another to provoke one another, he reads the verse, um, unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembly. So that's the, the meaning of meeting together, thus saith the word of God, to provoke unto love, because Peter said beyond all things love, all right, um, not repent, by the way. Um, let's just throw this in. Um, home fellowships under justification by new birth uh, we live a lifestyle of love, not repentance. Okay? So that's another big deal. We live a lifestyle of love, um, not repentance. Okay? Peter said, beyond anything, love one another fervently. Well, Paul, or a Peter, why didn't you say beyond anything, repent fervently? You know, so we can live by this gospel. You know? Okay? Um, so, uh, that's why we meet together, um, but exhorting one another much more as we see the day approaching. Alright, that is Hebrews 10, 24, 25. The assumption is, is that because we have dumped church, that we have forsaken the need for fellowship. Oh no. And I'm going to go ahead and put this up. Susan and I are going to uh, do a box cast on this. Susan and I um, are doing more love and more ministry now under the auspices of home fellowship than we would have ever dreamed to do being involved in in church okay and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that um yeah and that is true um verse 25 is cited as a command but in proper context it is presented at a contrast to the argument to the previous verse um Synagogue literally means meet together. And I just, I actually, I 
think we address this in the book, how synagogue and ecclesia mean pretty much the same thing. I think I have like three or four pages on that, if I remember correctly, um, because in my research I discovered that synagogue and ecclesia are pretty much the same idea. Okay, so I'm glad Andy brought that up, and I forget what page that's on. Um, you might go to the um, do a document search on the PDF that's online uh, that's for free, okay, that I have posted there, and you can do a, a word search of the document under synagogue and probably go to the area where we address that in the book. The various parts of the body aren't supposed to um, boast against each other, yet the church makes the pastor the most important over all the other gifts. Well, of course it does. Not only most important gift, um, it's not a gift, it's an authority. Okay? Um, you know, I'm even talking with one pastor. All right, let's let's stick this in here. In regard to literally being uh, born again and being in 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 infused with gifts from the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, we're in an email with the pastor that says the only thing that makes him a pastor is when a church. Uh, brings him on as the pastor. Uh, if that church ever fires him, he's no longer a pastor. Okay? Does that give you any insight into the mentality um, uh, uh, of church in regard to how the true body of Christ functions and the gifts that are given to it? When you're born again, if you've been given the gift of eldership, that that's going to be a gift you always have. Okay? Um, so it's, it's extraordinary. Okay? Um, so it's, that's another thing you could stick in there. You know, it's, it's a gift. Pastor is a gift, not an authority. Okay? Um, because we function as a body. All right, that's 12. Authority. We stuck fellowship in there. All right, we covered authority. Um, the role of the Word of God. Uh, let's put that. That's number 13. Number 13. Role of the Word of God. Okay. Role of the Word of God. Alright. So, in Protestantism, the Word of God only has one role. Okay. Um, this. Alright? The Word of God helps you realize your sinfulness in a deeper and deeper and deeper way. So you can realize how far you are away from your Father rather than how close. Okay? Um, and which, which gives you more and more gratitude for your uh, salvation indicated by the by the bigger cross. Uh, Al Mohler said it, I think I quote him in the book, um, that the sole purpose of the law of God is to keep leading us back to the cross for perpetual repentance. Okay? Um, what is the role of uh, the Word of God for those who believe um, the, God, the true gospel of justification by new birth. Uh, the Word of God is to primarily to educate ourselves uh, about reality and um, uh, about 
the best way to deliver the um, uh, gospel of justification by new birth to the world, but um, I forget where where it is in the book of the uh, is it Thessalonians. Here's how the verse goes. You can Google it. Um, this is the will of God for you, even your sanctification. So this is God's primary will for you, okay? That. Oh boy, we got a that coming. So, okay, God's primary will for us is uh, sanctification. Okay, Paul, got it. That. Oh, okay. So, Paul, what's your definition of sanctification? that you can learn how to control your body, okay? So, sanctification is using the wisdom of the Word of God to learn how to control your body in holiness, all right? Protestantism teach, teaches that that's not even ne near, neither here nor there. The, and you hear it all the time in church, all of our works are as filthy rags, right? Okay. Well, Paul, isn't that what Isaiah 61 says? Isn't that what it says? All of our... You know, what's the context to that? All right. But this whole idea that every single work that we could do as Christians, you know, are as... Like, I've had people when I say, you know, as uh, born-again Christians, uh, we really don't sin. Because the Bible says where there, is no, where there is no law, there is no sin. And I'm no longer under law, so as far as condemning sin, no, there's no way I can commit a condemning sin. And of course, if that were true, we wouldn't need church, because church is a sacramental religion. You can't get away with that. So once you've got to concur that it's a sacramental religion, you then have to ask, well, what's a sacrament? Duh. Okay. So um, um, Protestantism teaches, I mean, well, in, in regard to me saying, well, we don't sin, I mean, they'll quote that verse, you know, whoa, you know, the Bible says all of our works are as filthy rags. You know, so basically, but then if you say, oh, you know, Protestant teaches, Protestant orthodoxy teaches that the Christian can do no good works, which essentially means they can't love either. Well, they'll vehemently deny that, and in the same conversation after saying that all of our works are as filthy rags. Okay? So, roll of God. What do we got next here? Do, 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 the role of God, role of Jim, def, what do we got here? Role of, um, mm -hmm. sanctification, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let's see here, definition of assurance, do, 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 do. this may overlap some, we may have to eliminate some, um, but let, let's go ahead and stick salvation in there, okay? All right, 14. Salvation. Okay? And I'm going to make this simple. Salvation to us is a fin and I'm just going to write in here finished work versus process okay 14 all right which is why church is a sacramental religion okay which is why John P Piper plainly says all the time um, that, uh, um, that Christians still need to be saved. What are we talking about here? You know, 
Evangelicalism thinks John Piper's the... You know, I, there's some pockets of evangelicals that still have some discernment left and harp and carry on and whine about John Piper. I don't understand that. But when it gets right down to nitty gritty, he's the, the hottest thing since sliced bread in the evangelical church. And the guy comes right out and says as far back as... 1992, all right, that Christians still need salvation. What What are we even arguing about here? Okay, so salvation, uh, finished versus a process. Okay, salvation finished versus a process. Okay, 15. All right, 15. Um, role of the Word of God, role of Jesus in salvation, definition of love. Hmm. Okay. Mm. Role of Jesus in salvation. Let's do that. Okay, and I'm not going to get into I'm not going to get into what the Reformation really taught about the Trinity in regard to its Platonist views, but with justification by faith, Jesus is the whole enchilada. Okay. Um, God, even though the word God is used, Holy Spirit or Spirit, even though um, he's referred to, um, there's a reason why in church and in church land um, in general and among churchians together, it's everything Jesus. Jesus this, Jesus that. Jesus the other. Um, and in fact, um, the, the uh, justification by faith soteriology is, is really fundamentally predicated on what we call Christology or uh, Christo, um, Christocentricity, okay, or Christocentric. Okay, um, Protestantism is what we call a Christocentric theology. All right, Christ is really at the center of everything, and God plays um, second fiddle, and so does the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, Jesus' role in salvation. Um, for the most part, as far as the salvation part, according to uh, justification by the new birth, Jesus' primary role in salvation is to establish the new birth. Okay? To establish the gateway for men, women, and children to become, to literally become the offspring of God. Okay? Um, he primarily does that through his death, okay? Um, in fact, that's why in Galatians chapter 3, we find that, um, in Galatians chapter 3, we find that, um, the promise, which is the best word for the gospel, the promise all right, um, which is the first indication of the gospel where it's called something, the promise, and it's called that all through uh, the Bible. Uh, the promise was made to two people. All right, so how, how 
many times did you hear that in church? All right, that that the promise of the gospel was originally the promise, and it was made the two people. Who were the two people? The father of our faith, Abraham, and to Christ. Okay. So what was the promise made to Christ? The promise made to Christ was that God would not leave him in the gr grave to see corruption. Okay? The promise is that he would be resurrected from the dead by the Holy Spirit. So, God the Father elected the means of salvation. Okay? God the Father elected all right um, and it's actually we are actually as far as the new birth we are actually God's offspring okay so he's called God the Father for a reason we're his offspring okay so you got God the Father uh, Jesus his son who is our brothers all right and um, he died for our sins, okay? But then the Holy Spirit is the life giver in this whole thing. He resurrects uh, Jesus from the grave and establishes the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, uh, you know, or the new birth, okay? Um, so, uh, in... in um, justification by faith Christ has two roles and that is um, how would I put this I'm going to get my other marker board here all right because this is an important different difference and we got time to finish up with it okay so roles in salvation hmm Okay, roles in salvation. So, you've got Christ who died for our sins. I'm going to draw a circle and put um, uh, Christ, C, alright, and then I'm going to put S for Spirit, okay, and uh, so Christ um, died for our sins and uh, was resurrected uh, by the power of God's Spirit, okay? And then I'm going to put up here us and works, okay? So what happens here? Christ dies for our sin. He's resurrected by the Holy Spirit, which establishes the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's going to be Romans 6, okay? Romans 7 is how all that works with the law. And then, and then 8 is, Romans chapter 8 is the application of it, all right? But you see these works, okay? Um, the works, or the love, is done by us. Christ dying for our sin was the ultimate act of love, okay? We love him before because he first loved us, okay? And then, so, basically, it's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't help us, but what makes us a actually able to do legitimate acts of love is because, um... We do this. We do the works. Of course, Christ made it possible. He died for our sins, okay, and then was resurrected by the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, we've got God, I'll draw another circle with a G, elected the whole process, okay. So, we, um, we as justification by new birth, we call it a Trinitarian salvation. Um, it took a cooperative work by all three members of the Trinity. All right. 
Um, and I haven't done much study on the Trinity, but um, uh, a lot of the meaning of the Trinity has something to do with salvation making us literally God's family. You've got a father, you've got a son, okay? Um, now, so it's a Trinitarian sal salvation, okay? And um, we there do legitimate works of love that we will be rewarded for, okay? And this is all without the condemnation of the law. All right, so what's justification by faith, all right? Basically, Christ does everything, okay? Basically, Christ does everything, all right? He does um, the works, okay? And when it gets right down uh, to the nitty-gritty, um, um, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but um, true Protestant orthodoxy in the Reformed tradition, because it was the Reformation, uh, teaches that the Father and the Holy Spirit are subordinate to Christ. Okay? Uh, and I haven't taught much on that. Uh, maybe I need to start. But with, uh, um, you know, with justification by faith, it's what we call Christocentric, okay? And uh, Christ pretty much does everything, okay? Christ pretty much does everything. He died for our sins, okay? Um, he does all the works, all right? Every, everything is Christ, okay? Uh, and that's the doctrine of double imputation, where, um, and then of course it's all law-based, all right? Um, let me put it to you this way. Let me make it as simple as I can. Um, justification by faith, really, when it gets right down to the nitty-gritty, makes the law a fourth member of the Trinity. Okay? All right? And if you want to ask questions about that further, you can email us. Okay? So that's the major difference. Um, that's why justification by faith circumvents any real love by the believer because Christ came to fulfill the law uh, and die for our sins so that um, uh, forgiveness of sins and love or good works both are imputed to us to keep ourselves keep us saved through church ritual which pretty much boils down to a work salvation, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead and finish up for today with answering the question yesterday about um, this one up here, uh, location of righteousness, remember? And I ask you what the, the official Protestant doctrine was in re regard to that, and Martin Luther was a hint. Here it is. And we'll finish with this. Alien righteousness, right? Okay? That's a biggie, right? You hear that all the time about Martin, Martin Luther's alien righteousness. Okay? Uh, so, um, this isn't 